Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Bob Marsh. I'm a professor at the University of Southampton, and um, today I'm going to give a, a quick whistle-stop tour of the uh, global ocean, and I'm going to emphasise how connected it is, and, and in that respect, how connected we are by the ocean. So this is um, very much about the science of physical oceanography and ocean currents, but I hope that I can impress on you that, that these currents uh, interweave and connect through our, our lives around the coasts of the world's ocean and beyond. So what I'm going to be talking about today are a range of examples of how ocean currents move objects through the oceans and ultimately how that reflects the movement of the water itself. So we're starting off here with an example of how material moves away from Southampton. Um, specifically, we're looking at little um, kind of virtual drifting objects, which might be considered to be bits of plastic that public uh, accidentally drop into the uh, top of Southampton water there. And what you see in this little animation is that over a period of two weeks, 14 days, these little red dots are kind of working their way backwards and forwards with the what we call the semi-diurnal or twice a day tide. So as they move backwards and forwards, some of them get caught up and uh, they become pale colored and others stay with the, uh, the tidal currents. And some of them stay quite a long way up Southampton water, heading up into the uh, test estuary. But a few of them actually get gradually moved out towards the Solent, which is the, um, if I use my cursor here, uh, my pointer, you can see this is the Solent. And by day 14, we have three or four of these objects making their way out of the uh, Eastern Solent. So we would call this a, a residual flow. It's kind of a background flow um, in what is otherwise a tidally dominated uh, piece of um, our local sea, which is the Southampton Water in the Solent. So if I move to the next slide, you'll see that um, we're kind of scaling things up rather dramatically. And um, I'll talk in a second about what, what you're seeing there. And I should add that these are computer animations. They're, they're sort of a virtual reality, but I'll come back to that uh, shortly. So I'm talking about um, going, going from the very shallow uh, English Channel to the deep ocean. And you'll see that uh, in the top right hand corner, it's uh, highlighting that it takes just five years. It's a bit over, um, uh, over covered by me, but um, over about five years, the background currents convey objects from the central English Channel all the way to the Arctic Ocean, which is up here. This is called the Barents Sea. Um, and what's happening is that the background flow from our part of the English Channel is towards the northeast along the coastlines of, of the Netherlands and Germany, Denmark, around Skagerrak, following the Norwegian coast until finally they pass through the Arctic Circle at 66 North. And a few of these floating objects, which again we might consider to be bits of plastic that we accidentally dropped into Southampton water. So five years later, they're making their way slowly into the uh, Russian part of the Arctic up here. And indeed, we do now know that much of the plastic pollution that uh, enters the coastlines around the UK and other parts of North Europe is, is inevitably bound for the Arctic, where it may have some quite serious consequences for wildlife. OK, so I move on. Um, I'm now going to reflect briefly on the character of these flows. And first of all, I'm showing you uh, almost a cartoon of the ocean currents of, of the world, which you might find in one of the older textbooks that we use in oceanography. And these currents are rather well organized and looping in these grand, what we call gyres. So this is called the, the gyre uh, of, of the subtropical Atlantic and there's one in the North Pacific and the South Pacific and the South Atlantic and 
in the Indian Ocean. And other, other than that, we see some fairly strong currents on the uh, west side of the big oceans. That these are uh, well known to some people as the swift uh, so-called boundary currents, and this is the Gulf Stream. I won't go into the details of, of, of that today, um, but I do want to emphasize the smoothness and the organization of, of this schematic representation of the world's ocean and its movement. Now, in reality, things are a lot messier. Uh, and what you see here is some uh, real observation of the movement of floating drifters, which are um, kind of man-made objects that are intentionally moving with the ocean currents. And since the late 1970s, this has been well organized into a, a global program of data, to, data collection, which means that um, scientists like myself and colleagues have access to the uh, hourly movements of hundreds and hundreds of these um, drifters. Now in this picture here, whoops, you see um, to some of you the well-known region of the Tasman Sea between Australia and New Zealand. And here's Tasmania. And um, each drifting uh, instrument has been coloured with a different um, colour, randomly selected, so that we have a kind of messy spaghetti. There is a degree of organisation along the east coast of Australia, this is called the East Australian Current, unsurprisingly, and elsewhere you see a few other uh, organised flows, but in many parts of the ocean things are pretty chaotic, and that, that's the ocean's version of the weather um, that is uh, around us in the atmosphere all the time, and we get good days and bad days, and we've recently uh, seen the end of some fine weather, and, and now we're into a a more unsettled spell. And um, so from many, many years, these over plotted um, trajectories of ocean drifters tell us that um, there's lots of weather in the ocean and it means that um, things move rather chaotically around. And we have to take that into account when we want to understand how things drift around the oceans, which I'll be sort of referring back to. Um, I should also um, say a few words about the history of understanding and measuring uh, ocean currents. So for about uh, 200 years now, we've been able to identify that there are some very uh, distinct patterns in, in the ocean. So despite that chaos, we do see a degree of organization. And um, one of the pioneers of this observation was uh, Major James Runnell. And he was able to use ship drift, uh, so measurements of how the ships were moving through, through the oceans relative to what they would perhaps expect, um, telling them something about the local current. And so these little arrows you see here are his attempt uh, over 200 years ago to say where the currents are and which direction they're pointing you um, as, as you drift around at sea. And I've talked about those, uh, those drifters, and this is actually uh, an example then of the kind of modern technology for measuring ocean currents. This is my colleague, Eric Van Seville, and he's casting a drifter off a, a research vessel. This is what it looks like. So it floats uh, buoyantly at the surface. It's um, dragged around by what we call this, um, this holy sock, uh, and it reports its position every few hours to a satellite, which we can then recover uh, as a big data set, such as the one I just showed you. Now, um, observations are, are really essential for understanding the reality of how the oceans move, but the, because the oceans are so vast and because um, we need observations ideally all the time, which is impossible and everywhere, then what we often would prefer to do is to resort to a virtual reality, which, which is what I'm just briefly explaining and introducing on this slide here. So in order to get a really big um, overview of how things move through the oceans, then we would um, use computer models of the ocean, which give us complete data sets of ocean currents. And then from those data sets of ocean currents, we will calculate our own kind of virtual particle drift. We call these drifters particles. And uh, myself and various other colleagues for the last uh, 25 years now have been developing methods for capturing this very rich 
drift information from, from ocean models. And you see some examples in the uh, figure to the right hand side here of, of what happens when you release um, some particles along the north coast of Europe here. And you can now, remembering what I showed you a bit earlier using a, uh, an alternative method, appreciate that over a time period of a few years, then um, the particles will gradually drift um, northwards. That's what you see in most of these uh, examples. Depending how you make the calculation, they more or less disperse because of the chaos, which I've just emphasized. So as this color gets, um, if you like, less warm, um, moving from red to yellow, then the density of the particles is declining. And so this is showing us how the ocean uh, moves things, but also disperses them all over the place. And, and that's why we have um, these problems with, for example, garbage patches where the world's microplastic is being gathered together but over a very large scale in some of the ocean basins of consequential wildlife, as I said earlier, for the Arctic. So I'm going to show some examples of using this kind of method to follow the ocean and follow objects that we are interested in understanding. Now, an example of that would be uh, the rather um, early life um, turtle hatchlings that appear on a few special beaches around the world's oceans. And for the first few months or up to one year of their life, they're very small and they don't have a very strong ability to swim independent of the ocean currents. So they tend to get swept away. Those of them that make it offshore, and you know that um, from various wildlife documentaries, only a fraction can make it offshore because there's a lot of predators that are very interested in these guys. So um, eventually, um, the lucky survivors are making it offshore. Now, in the movie that you see underneath, the animation, there are 42 open black circles that each represent uh, a colony that we know today to be important for the population of sea turtles. There are five species represented in these 42 circles. And from each circle, we release 1,000 virtual turtle hatchlings. And they all are released at slightly different times and locations within the circle, which means that they, they all experience a slightly different version of the ocean currents, which are chaotic. And in this model simulation of the ocean currents, um, the chaos of those currents means that the population of 1,000 hatchlings per um, beach is widely dispersed. So I could talk about this for rather a long time, uh, but I will make a few points. First of all, it's a 365 day simulation. So you see this day counter down here. We, we plot the location of the 1,000 hatchlings every five days. So you see that uh, stepping up every five, up to day 365, and then goes back to the beginning. And there's a, quite, a great variety in the uh, experience of the 1,000 hatchlings, depending where they start from, so which beach they come from. So if you consider, for example, let me try and point to, uh, for example, uh, these, these two circles here are the Galapagos. And they're slightly either side of the Galapagos Islands, which means that the, the hatchlings from these start locations, they drift off first of all towards the west, uh, but, but they also drift um, away from the equator. I'll come back to that later. Uh, depending where you start off, you may have a more or less dynamic experience. So those Galapagos hatchlings get um, carried quite rapidly away from the Galapagos. Uh, this is the Ascension, uh, this is Ascension Island and the tur sea turtles that live here are not swept away quite so dramatically in comparison to uh, for example, the counterparts here in uh, equatorial Africa. Um, sea turtles hatching in Hawaii also have a fairly um, quiet experience in the first year of their life. <coughs> sea turtles that hatch uh, off Florida <coughs> carried into the Gulf Stream and some of them will make it all the way across the Atlantic in the first year of their life. Um, sea turtles that um, head south along the coast here of South Africa get um, the experience of being pulled in two directions south, south of Africa. Some get pulled into the 
South Atlantic and others get pulled off into the Southern Ocean down here. So there's an awful lot going on. And what these um, biological uh, virtual data are telling us is something about the diversity of the ocean currents uh, across a range of latitudes and longitudes. Okay, I think I've said plenty about this. I would like to move now to talk about three objects of interest, apart from sea turtles, um, which are kind of dramatically il illustrating how, how much is out there in the oceans. And um, the first object I'm going to talk about is uh, pumice stones. Now, you probably know that pumice is uh, a very porous uh, siliceous rock, which we sometimes um, use, use in the bath, um, bathroom. And uh, it floats because um, there's more, more air pockets in pumice than your typical rock. And this is a volcanic rock which has been somehow blasted out of the earth. And um, what people probably don't realise is that there are several volcanoes that are sub-surface. So um, rather than the, the great volcanoes that we know of uh, above ground, we have these um, deep volcanoes in, in the ocean. And when they erupt, which they do, from time to time, they produce sometimes huge volume of pumice stone, which um, is, is buoyantly carried up to the surface where it spreads out as these great um, uh, rafts of pumice. And what you see here is a photograph taken last August of 2019 uh, by, by a sailor, uh, Shannon Lentz, who was, um, happened, happened to be sailing in the um, tropical South Pacific um, a, a couple of days after uh, an unknown eruption at that time, which covered the surface of that area with this uh, great um, pumice raft. So this is actually the ocean, it's not land. You feel like you could walk across this, it might be the surface of a planet almost, but um, th this is just the surface of the ocean with some very gentle swell waves imposed on it. And, and once we knew about this, um, we wanted to follow up on a, a study that we carried out several years ago. First of all, I'll explain then is what you're actually seeing in the previous photograph. So each uh, pumice stone, uh, maybe of a different size, uh, is, is very um, porous and samples have been collected and brought back to the lab to have a look at um, the chemical composition and the structure of these, these pumice stones. And you can see how large they are. Um, a colleague of mine, the University of Tasmania called Martin Yutzler is particularly interested in in this phenomenon and we've worked together to explore the spreading of pumice uh, away from the eruption site carried by those ocean currents and uh, Martin's very interested in, in the utility of uh, satellite sensors which can observe the um, development of these pumice rafts over time so after a few weeks I think about a couple of weeks uh, the, the pumice rafts of, of that South Pacific eruption had been spread out and kind of elongated, as you see in this yellow hoop over here. This is looking down from space, the region uh, near Fiji, um, Tonga. And you can see these streaks of brown uh, on the surface of the ocean. And those are the, the pumice rafts that are now spreading out and developing uh, according to the background ocean currents, which are really in control of them. And here's another picture from space, and you can see these streaky um, patterns uh, that, that are making their way past this uh, island, uh, La Beca Island of Fiji, uh, in early September of 2019. So this pumice uh, kind of starts to drift around the South Pacific. Uh, it, it, some of it um, drifts ashore uh, as it encounters islands and land. Um, what we did, uh, on an earlier occasion in response to a previous eruption in 2012 uh, just north of New Zealand was to use uh, this this mod model method I described earlier so taking uh, ocean currents from an ocean model to calculate the drift of thousands of particles that are representative in this case of the pumice that started off here uh, after 30 days in a small patch and as the days went by to day 60, 90, 120, 180 the patch uh, in, this, in this region, it grew uh, quite sort of um, evenly, I suppose, um, in the sort of east, west and north, south directions. And we were comparing our 
model predictions of how the ocean currents would move the patch with some satellite observations of the patch from space. And um, we begin to understand uh, that this pumice is going to move um, on a very predictable basis as far as we understand the ocean currents and their strength and direction. So we've been repeating that exercise uh, a bit more extensively um, for the most recent eruption near Tonga, which starts off over here. And what, you're show what I'm showing you in these uh, figures are the long-term, um, is the long-term destination of, of this pumice. So on a 30-day timescale, the pumice is headed towards Fiji. And that's where we started to see it appearing uh, on some of the beaches there. On a two-year timescale, so that's what we're seeing down in the bottom um, panels. So if we look forwards over two years, we think this pumice is going to spread out far and wide. And it's going to be quite evenly distributed uh, all over this region to the east of Australia. A lot of it's going to wash up on the beaches of Australia and the Great Barrier Reef. Some of it's going to make its way uh, through what we call the Indonesian archipelago on into the Indian Ocean. So this pumice, which starts at a single point, which is a volcano beneath the surface, to the, uh, to the east of Fiji, the little uh, red symbol here, it, it's going to be soon very widespread indeed. So here we are, um, nearly, well, approaching a year after the eruption, and I guess already it will be widely distributed in, in the islands of Polynesia. And why does that matter? Well, um, rather interestingly, it turns out that pumice is a, it's kind of a life raft for all kinds of um, organisms. Uh, so various, various uh, species here of uh, mollusk and uh, an enemy, barnacles, uh, they, they'll cluster on the pumice stones, which will carry them as, as they drift uh, on their way. And this, this helps to disperse these um, species over a very wide, um, range of longitude in particular, but also latitude. And, and that's been going on really forever, uh, I should say, ever since uh, uh, life has been um, evolved in the oceans and uh, able to um, attach to pumice stones. So this may explain the distribution of many uh, tropical species, that these uh, quite frequent volcanic events provide life rafts for um, these, these organisms to uh, colonize distant coastlines, for example. And just to give you finally an idea of how uh, often uh, these events happen, there's been an attempt here by Brian Attell, uh, a paper of 2012, to uh, identify locations of subsurface eruptions and pumice rafting. And you can see actually that we now realize that they're, they're a bit more frequent and commonplace than we perhaps realized uh, when, when they were first noticed um, in, in recent decades. So they, they can be identified way back to the 19th century uh, and the pumice from these um, eruptions is, is distributed on a very wide scale uh, by the ocean current. So this is uh, the Krakatoa eruption of 1883 and the pumice from, from that eruption would have probably reached uh, East Africa uh, maybe a year or so later. And if we take a sort of more idealized view of all that and consider the total number of um, subsea volcanoes worldwide, and particularly you see the ring of fire around the Pacific Basin here, and think about ideally how much pumice could be distributed six months after an eruption if they were to all erupt at the same time, which would be rather ridiculous. But uh, just hypothetically, if that happened, then the world ocean would be this filled with pumice drifting away in a varying distribution uh, concentration, if you like, from its origin. So the ocean will be pretty, pretty much full of pumice. You'd find it all over the place. And today, if you go to beaches off uh, the east coast of Australia, you can always pick up pumice stones that, that have been lying there for maybe a few years from a recent eruption. And now for something completely different. Um, and this is um, what we call the Great Sargassum Belt. It's a, a recent phenomenon in the tropical North Atlantic. What you see here uh, is far out in, in the middle of the tropical Atlantic, um, photographed from a Dutch research vessel, um, a expansive mat of what we call uh, sargassum seaweed. And this is a seaweed that grows in the open ocean far away from the coast. Um, and 
it really is um, quite phenomenal now in its extent and it's been uh, developing and growing uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, I was fortunate enough to visit the Caribbean uh, for research purposes in summer 2018 and I, I took a picture here on, on this lonely beach on the east, uh, the northeast coast of a, a little island called Barbuda on the 6th of June. And this is um, during the build-up to the biggest uh, inundation so far in 2018 when huge amounts of sargassum started to appear in the Caribbean. This is what it looks like uh, as, as it begins to gather at the coastline. It just completely covers the beach. Uh, and it becomes a, a major issue for the people that live in the Caribbean. So there's a question about whether this is a new normal. Uh, and what to do about it because uh, it doesn't just sit there, it rots and it gives off toxic gases, affects human health and uh, has some serious implications for their tourist industry, albeit currently shut down through the uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic. So we've been starting to work together with people in the Caribbean and West Africa to understand the uh, extent and the prediction of, of this kind of uh, annual uh, inundation which they're experiencing. So this is um, the extent of the inundation uh, in 2018 when the sargassum extended all the way from the central uh, equatorial Atlantic to uh, the Gulf of Mexico and you can see the, uh, the deep colours here indicate the extent of this um, sargassum at that time. It varies year to year and we're beginning to understand the reasons for this variation but it's ultimately conveyed by ocean currents and by understanding those ocean currents we can be better understand where this sargassum is headed and, and to prepare for its arrival essentially. And why this is happening I will say just very briefly that um, the climate is varying and changing in this region and um, without going through all these details we have to understand changing nutrient levels in the ocean, which are in turn related to changes perhaps going on uh, in Amazonia, changes in the Sahel region of Africa, which may be in introducing more dust to the system, changes in the climate, changes in the currents and the winds. So these are all factors that we need to consider when understanding what's going on in, in the tropical Atlantic right now. I realize that time is going on. I'm gonna try and reach the end, but I may speed up and go a little bit quick just to get through uh, my remaining slides. So as, as we move towards a, a deeper understanding of sargassum, we need to use um, these innovative technologies such as these micro drifters um, that are very small and cheap, can be tossed into a, a sargassum patch and they drift with the sargassum. So we're beginning to understand more and more about whether sargassum is, is drifting and relating that to our predictions with ocean models and drift calculations. So my title here is slightly obscured. It's um, number three, icebergs. So I'll very quickly explain to you that um, a much larger object that drifts around the ocean uh, is an iceberg. And this is a tabular iceberg near Antarctica, which we were very interested in following. Uh, this this uh, carved away from what's called Pine Island Glacier in uh, summer, northern summer, uh, southern winter, of 2013 and we tracked it with satellites uh, away from its um, kind of place of origin here in Pine Island Bay. Um, I'm interested in icebergs that carve away from Greenland which is up here and uh, in fact I took these photographs from a commercial flight over to a conference uh, in the United States uh, back in 2014 and you can see there are icebergs all over the place um, you can film them and photograph them from a commercial plane which I did at point B and point A over here so A and B um, and in the background or at least um, plotted uh, on these charts here you can see the concentration uh, or the counts of icebergs along the coast of uh, Labrador and Newfoundland and this is called Iceberg Alley um, and Iceberg Alley is, is the primary sort of stream of icebergs into the northwest Atlantic and as, as they um, sea ice retreats every spring these icebergs are kind of released to the wild and they, they drift away with what's called the Labrador current and they get carried away into this relatively warm patch of the Northwest Atlantic where they melt away. And that's a very variable um, uh, phenomenon. So here you see um, a series of uh, examples of the 15th of April distribution of icebergs in Northwest Atlantic and the warmer colours mean more icebergs and so 
there were a few years around 2000, 10, 11, 13, when there were very few icebergs in the Northwest Atlantic. And then in 2014, they came back and we had some really quite um, extensive iceberg um, coverage. And, and little X marks the spot where the Titanic um, was struck on the 15th of April, uh, 1912. So you can see how unfortunate it was uh, to encounter an iceberg this far south. Uh, but you can see that also there is an occasional iceberg down there, uh, for example, in 2014 and 2019. And so um, the reason these icebergs reach more or less south is partly related to, again, the ocean currents, which convey them down into the uh, mid latitudes. And um, I'll come back to those ocean currents rather, uh, those specific currents in a minute. I tried to go and see some of these icebergs and here you can see a photograph I took offshore of um, North Newfoundland in June of 2018 in a little village called Twillingate. Um, it's quite a long way offshore, uh, but it coincided with the um, observed um, charted distribution of icebergs at that time. So that's some sort of in situ confirmation of, of, the, um, of the data that you see in the chart. We also model these icebergs with uh, ocean models. These are a couple of examples from the northern and southern hemisphere and those icebergs that I've just talked about um, that flow down the Labrador current. This is where that one was. Um, my colleague uh, Eric, um, who I mentioned earlier, uh, photographed this piece of ice, um, which is not quite an iceberg, but this was located in this region here um, around Antarctica. Antarctica produces around six times more icebergs than Greenland because that's a much bigger ice sheet and they really do kind of uh, make a striking appearance all the way around Antarctica. But these are simulations I should add, it's very difficult to actually obtain observations like this so we have to simulate those with a, with a model, computer. Um, finally I'm just going to emphasize that we uh, ultimately are in following objects we're following water and this rather complicated diagram is just to highlight that we have um, a number of very important rivers around the world. Uh, this is the Congo, the Amazon, um, the Ganges, um, I forget all the names, the Mekong, the Pearl, the Yangtze. And I'm going to just emphasize the importance of, of these rivers in introducing fresh water into the oceans. Um, the Rhine here, uh, I'm using a, a sort of particle tracking method just to illustrate what happens to Rhine waters. So they the, these Rhine waters flow out here off the Netherlands and then they make their way as the plastic uh, that might have entered the English Channel earlier. Uh, they, these, these waters are following the circulation, we call it, and they go into the Norwegian coastal current and they head for the Arctic. And they help to freshen this, this whole region. Um, if, if we look at the lower latitudes, then this is the um, salinity, so this is how fresh the water is around um, South and Southeast Asia and these blue sort of um, swirls represent the outflows of, of these great rivers and, and in particular I've plotted this um, salinity during the monsoon season and this is when the most fresh water is, is entering the Bay of Bengal um, or, the, or the South China Sea. Uh, over here, I just put a red star over a place um, called Qingdao, which I'll refer back to later. Uh, and so it's very important to understand how fresh water goes into the ocean because it carries with it uh, a load of nutrient, which I mentioned earlier could explain the proliferation of sargassum. So um, moving to the Atlantic, um, the Atlantic is a huge um, sort of monster of a river by comparison to all the other rivers in the world's oceans. And here I'm using a, a tracking method again to show you just how uh, dispersed is the Atlantic outflow. And you can see whether you're looking at May or November that um, the Amazon outflow is following what we call the North Brazil current. Uh, some of it heads uh, along with the Guyana and Caribbean currents into the, the loop current of the Gulf of Mexico and finally into the Gulf Stream like this. And with it goes this relatively fresh water as a low salinity imprint, which carries that lower salinity water all the way uh, through the Caribbean. And, and so fresh water comes out like that. In a, in a sort of contrast, we get very high salinity water from places of high evaporation, such as the Mediterranean, 
um, the Arabian Sea and, and the Red Sea. And the water from these um, uh, marginal seas, it goes into the world's ocean as very high salinity uh, outflows. It spills out and kind of fills up the deeper ocean. Now what I'm trying to sort of get across to you is that these different kinds of water uh, entering the sides of the ocean and adding up to the totality of the global ocean. Final thoughts I want to sort of um, share are that we need to understand the, the character of the, the way these drifts and currents work. So just going back to the, uh, the turtle hatchling simulation from earlier, after this is supposed to be 180 days and this is 365 days. So as time goes by, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a gradual drift apart of particles that start life near the equator. And that's a, a phenomenon that we well understand in, in physical oceanography, alongside the, uh, the currents that flow swiftly along the coastlines. So in order to put this together, we need to also understand the steady currents uh, which we see more dominant perhaps as we go towards um, the poles. So this is an example, and there are many others I could show you, of, of how the water moves, uh, for example, with that fresh Norwegian current, NC, um, which becomes what we call the West Spitsbergen current, and that goes up into the, uh, into the Arctic here. Uh, out of the Arctic comes the East Greenland current, which becomes the uh, East Iceland current, and everywhere you look through the oceans we have named currents, which are fairly predictable, although somewhat chaotic. And associated with these flows are changes of temperature, which I'm going to emphasize right at the end. So as water moves to higher latitudes, it gets colder, as you'd expect. So if you went for a holiday uh, in the Arctic, you'd get colder too. Uh, likewise, if you head down towards the equator, you'd get warmer. And the same thing's going on in the ocean. Water's moving northward and southward, um, towards and away from the equator, getting warmer and colder. And that process of getting warmer and colder leads ultimately to a three-dimensional character of the circulation because when water gets cold, it gets dense. When it gets dense, it heads down and that fills up the deep ocean. So what I've been uh, bringing together now, everything I've been saying, um, whether we look at objects or the water itself, I'm looking at an individual location, we might find uh, a kind of a fragmentary piece of drift, should we call it that? So just a small piece of the global ocean jigsaw of uh, flow. So these little white arrows are just mentioning uh, or reminding you of um, some of those themes that I've introduced. So this is the Mediterranean water coming out here, Red Sea, Arabian Sea, this is the Ganges. Um, this is um, the Yangtze, the Labrador Current, the East Greenland Current, the Norwegian Current, and I could go on. Of course also, we have some drift away from Galapagos. Now, if we take all of these fragmentary drifts and we start thinking about what, what they mean together, what they mean is a circulation. They all connect, everything connects. So if I just finish by thinking about um, two very um, separate places in the North Atlantic, both called St. John's, uh, the capital of um, the small island state of Antigua is St. John's and the capital of the um, province Newfoundland is also St John's and they're at two very different latitudes 17 and 47 north and I actually took these pictures uh, just a, a few weeks apart because I went to Antigua for a research trip and I went to Newfoundland for a vacation um, and um, obviously nice weather on both occasions this was a lot more humid um, but um, there's something in common with these these two St John's they're twinned in both name, but also what we call the upper branch of the three-dimensional three Atlantic circulation. So that's the surface um, flow. Um, and, and I can explain that now just by bringing them together. So the, the white star is St. John's and the, the yellow star is uh, also St. John's. Um, but of course, Newfoundland and Antigua. And this is a three-dimensional cartoon made by some colleagues um, in the US, Marshall and Spear. They published this uh, a few years ago now, and it just simplifies um, the, the global ocean circulation in three dimensions. So to some extent, this is conveying to you that we have a surface flow, uh, which turns into a deep flow, and it all joins together. And the, the importance of that is that it uh, brings together um, warm and cold water at global scale of consequence for our climate. And this summarizes, as best I can, in, in a few photographs, 
how that circulation takes water uh, through through higher and lower temperatures. So that's what the red and the, the blue is, is um, referring to. And that change or transformation from cold to warm or from warm to cold is, is a steady part of our climate system, which is nevertheless changing all the time and it may change a lot in the future. And so as we go around the, um, the photos here, I'm just showing you some of my own personal experiences of ocean currents uh, and locations where ocean currents affect the climate. This is the Southern Ocean on a quiet day and a stormy day. This is that iceberg. This is some pumice. This is the, uh, the East China Sea and on we go. Um, so I'll finish by reminding people um, that uh, I've talked about surface drift primarily. Um, and whether we look at surface drift um, of a particular object in a, in a, uh, a local uh, context, uh, or whether we look uh, more broadly, we can start to see a bigger pattern emerging. And these surface drifts reveal fragments of what is a global connected circulation. So ocean currents, they link remote locations. Um, so sargassum drifts all across the entire tropical Atlantic, pumice drifts pretty much worldwide, uh, baby turtle hatchlings are carried around the ocean basins, icebergs drift from high latitudes to lower latitudes. But ultimately they affect us and so they link communities um, and sometimes what they bring ashore isn't necessarily uh, wanted. Uh, possibly it could be an opportunity but usually it causes us to um, solve a problem. And so finally my last bullet here is that um, ocean currents uh, both driving but also connecting environmental change. So not just climate change but change in, in the ecosystems of the world and the pollution that we are uh, increasingly adding to it. So on that note, uh, I'll leave you, um, thank you for your attention and goodbye. Hi, my name is Mia. I'm the Acting Programme Lead at A-Space Arts. I'd like to thank you for watching this video and if you can spare a few pennies for GHT, please follow the link in the description below to donate to our PayPal account. The money you donate will help support the organisation through this difficult time and allow us to continue developing content like this to keep us all entertained at home. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking here and hitting subscribe and you can watch more quality content from GHT by clicking here. Thanks again everybody and stay safe.